This lecture is part of Berkeley Math 115, an introductory undergraduate course on number theory, and will be about proving that certain Dirichlet series do not vanish at um, the value s equals 1. So just briefly recall, chi is a Dirichlet character, so chi of n plus some capital N is equal to chi of n, so it's periodic and it's multiplicative. Um, and um, it vanishes um, unless um, uh, n is co-prime to capital N. Um, and the, we recall the Dirichlet L series is given by L chi of S is equal to um, chi of 1 over 1 to the S plus chi of 2 over 2 to the S and so on. And um, last lecture we showed that if L chi of 1 is non-zero for um, for chi um, of period n, um, chi not being the special character which is is one everywhere. Then this implies Dirichlet's theorem that there are an infinite number of primes um, in arithmetic progressions um, um, with, with with period capital n. So um, what we've got to do. Uh, to complete the proof is to show that these L functions are non-zero at this special point S equals 1. Um, well, method 1 is quite easy. We can just calculate them. So we can just calculate L chi of 1 and check numerically that it's non-zero. For instance, we've seen this before. If chi um, of n is the function that goes 1, 0, minus 1, 0, 1, and so on, then L chi of 1 is just equal to 1 minus a third plus 1 over fifth, and so on. And we can see this is non-zero either by calculating it explicitly and noting that it's pi over 4, or as I pointed out earlier, we can just note that the sum of the first two terms is positive and the sum of the next two is positive, and so on. So for any particular L function, there's no real difficulty in proving it doesn't vanish at s equals 1. The problem is to prove that all L functions um, are non-zero at s equals 1. So for any finite number of L functions we can just do it by calculation and the, 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 the problem is to try and do it for all of them. Um, so a key point in the proof so, so a key point in the proof is to find a product of L functions whose log has coefficients that are all greater than or equal to zero. And this sort of idea seems to turn up an awful lot. Um, somehow, if you can find Dirichlet series with non-negative coefficients, that makes them a lot easier to handle. And although um, L functions don't have non-negative coefficients in general, if you multiply them together in a clever way, you can sometimes arrange for this. Um, well, why should we want L functions to have non-negative coefficients? Well, well, there's a very useful lemma due to Landau um, this is an analogue of the following theorem in complex analysis. So first of all, I'll give the theorem for power series. Um, suppose A0 plus A1x plus A2x squared and so on is a power series. And suppose this is radius of convergence um, equal to R with 0 less than R is less than infinity. Um, if all the a i are greater than or equal to zero, um, and this function is f of x, then f of x is singular at um, x equals r. In other words, it must have it mu cannot possibly be holomorphic at the real point, real positive number r. Um, so Landau's lemma is an analog of this for Dirichlet series. Um, it says suppose um, a1 over n over 1 to the s plus a2 over 2 to the s and so on is a Dirichlet series. And, and suppose it converges for 
um, s greater than some number s zero, but not for s less than s zero. So, so um, you remember Dirichlet series converge in half planes, not not in disks. So, so um, the, the s zero sort of describes the half plane of convergence rather than the rather than the disk of convergence. I, I guess I could say for real part of s greater than that. Um, um, if all the a i are greater than or equal to zero, then the function has singularity at um, s equals s zero. So it must have a singularity on the real axis um, right on the boundary of the region where it converges. So I'm, I'm not going to prove either of these. I'm just going to quote them. Um, from complex analysis. They're, they're not particularly difficult to prove, but it's really analysis, not number theory. So um, we've got to come up with um, a product of L series whose logarithm has non-negative coefficients. And let's look at, let's take the product over all i of L chi i of s. So we're taking a product of all the um, L series. And if we take the logarithm of this, it looks uh, so, so the logarithm of the product of L chi i of s is easy to work out because we know the we, 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 we know the logarithm of all the L series because they have Euler products, and it turns out to be sum over all i and sum over all p to the n of chi i p to the n divided by n times p to the n s. And if we if we sum over chi i over all i, we know that this is um, one if p to the n is congruent to one modulo n and zero otherwise. So this just becomes um, phi of n, that's Euler's function, times sum over p to the n congruent to one modulo n of one over n to p to the n s. And we notice that all the coefficients are greater than or equal to zero. So we're, we're, we're in a nice case where we can sort of go on applying Landau's theorem and things like that. Um, by the way, this product is exactly the product used um, to show there are infinitely many primes that are congruent to one modulo n in the previous lecture. So this isn't a new product. We've actually We've actually seen this before. We're just noting that it has um, positive coefficients. And we can also have another remark. It is more or less <coughs> um, the zeta function of a cyclotomic field. OK, well, explaining what a cyclotomic field is and explaining what the zeta function is is a very interesting topic, but um, it's not really suitable for an introductory number theory lecture, and it takes uh, many hours, so I'm just going to leave this as a, as a mysterious comment. Um, so uh, now, um, in particular, um, um, so the logarithm of this product of L chi i s is certainly greater than or equal to zero. So uh, the product of the L chi i s is greater than or equal to one for s greater than or equal to uh, for, 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 for s greater than for s greater than one. Um, in particular, this product is not zero at s equals one because it's 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 at least one for s greater than one, so it can't suddenly become zero at s equals one. Um, um, now uh, we notice that L chi zero of s as a pole at s equals one. So you remember this was the chi zero was the character that was one almost everywhere, and this is more or less. Um, the Riemann zeta function, which, which has a pole at s equals one. Um, now suppose that L chi i s is zero at s equals one. Well, then the zero here is going to cancel out the pole here, so this product is is is, is going to be finite. However, um, we can do more than that because L chi i 
bar s is also equal to zero. So for any character, we can take its complex conjugate. Now we notice that if chi i is not equal to its complex conjugate, in other words, if chi i is not real, then we get two zeros, um, one from L of chi i and one of L chi i bar. So this, this would imply that... Um, uh, th th this would mean that this was e it included a factor of L chi zero, which was infinite, and L chi i, which was zero, and L chi i bar, which was also zero. And now the pole at s equals one of this function would cancel out with the zero at s equals one of this function, but then there would be another zero of this function. It would make this product equal to zero. So, so this is not possible. So we see that if so if chi i is not equal to the complex conjugate of chi i, so, so chi i is not real, then, then L chi i of 1 cannot be 0. Um, by the way, I should just mention that there's um, a, a high-level proof that this product overall overall i of l chi i of one um, is infinite, and this is to f you, you use the fact that the residue of the product over all i of l chi i of s um, is equal to a constant times a class number of the cyclotomic field, whatever the class number is. And this actually shows that um, this function here has a pole at s equals 1, so none of these functions can have zeros at s equals 1, because if they did, they would cancel out the pole of L chi of 0. Um, however, as I said, cyclotomic fields and class numbers of cyclotomic fields is rather um, rather too much to describe in detail for this lecture. But I'll, I'll just say that um, if you don't like the sort of rather ad hoc techniques we're using to show that L chi i is, of 1 is non-zero, there are some sort of more conceptual high-powered techniques. Um, well, proving that L chi of 1 is not zero when, when chi is real, so that chi squared is equal to the chi squared is equal to 1, is rather tricky. Um, there definitely seems to be some sort of glitch here of trying to estimate L chi of 1 when, 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 when chi squared is 1. This problem turns up quite a lot. There, there, there are several problems, like um, trying to estimate class numbers of imaginary quadratic fields that depend on showing not just that this number is non-zero, but that it doesn't get too small. And it's very difficult to to give a good lower bound on, on this number when chi is order 2. There's some sort of weird problem here. Anyway, um, one way to show this is non-zero is to use Landau's theorem. So we know that the product over i of L chi i s is holomorphic for s not equal to 1. That's because we can check that each of these L series can be extended to a holomorphic function. Um, we, we, we sort of sketched earlier how you can do this when the real part of S is at least 0, and with a little bit more effort we can do it for all S, but we don't really need this. Um, now, the only possible pole comes from the pole of L um, chi 0 s at s equals 1. Um, and if some L chi i of 1 was equal to 0, this would cancel the pole. And um, the product over i of L chi i s would be holomorphic for all s. However, you can obtain a contradiction from this using using Landau's theorem. So, so the, the, the coefficients are all positive. So um, if it's holomorphic for all s and the coefficients are positive, this would imply it converges everywhere. 
However, it's pretty easy to see it doesn't converge everywhere. For instance, at, at, at s equals zero, um, it has an infinite number of um, non-zero terms, all integers all integers greater than or equal to zero if you expand it out. So it definitely doesn't converge at s equals zero. So this gives a contradiction and implies that L chi i of one is, is, is not zero, even if chi i has order two. Um, well, we can actually do better than this. Um, so you remember for the Riemann zeta function, we showed that L, sorry, sorry we showed that zeta of 1 plus i t is not zero. We can also show the same thing for, for, for the um, Dirichlet L series. We can show that the Dirichlet L series of 1 plus i t is not equal to zero. So um, it, 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 these functions not only don't vanish at s equals 1, they don't vanish at any complex point with real part 1. And to do this, we kind of copy the proof for the, for the zeta function. So for the zeta function, we looked at the function um, zeta of 1 plus 2it, or zeta of sigma plus 2it times zeta of sigma plus it the 4 times zeta of sigma um, to the 6 plus times zeta of sigma minus i t to the 4 times zeta of sigma minus 2 i t. And we took the logarithm of this and we observed that the logarithm had all coefficients greater than or equal to 0. So, so, so this function here is greater than or equal to 1. Now for L series we do something similar except we take L of chi squared of sigma plus 2 i t times L of chi of um, sigma plus i t times um, zeta of so to the 4 times zeta of sigma plus i t to the 6 times L of chi bar of sigma minus i t to the 4 times L of chi bar squared times sigma minus 2 i t. So it's a bit complicated, but if you take the logarithm of this, you see the logarithm is turns out to be always greater than or equal to zero for essentially the same reason the logarithm of this was always greater than or equal to zero. And I, I think you probably don't want me to write out that rather messy calculation again. It, it, it just comes down to the fact that z plus z to the minus one to the four is always greater than or equal to, 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 to zero provided um, z is a, um, a complex number of absolute value one. Um, and this almost implies that L of sigma plus i t can't be um, zero because we notice that this is a pole of order six. And this is a zero of order four. And this is a zero of order four. And so we can repeat the argument for so this proves that this function here has a zero of order two um, um, when, um, uh, when, when sigma equals one, unless one of these has a pole. And this is where, where, where we get this glitch again. So um, um, we can ask, does this have a pole? Well, the only way it can have a pole is if chi squared is equal to 1, because these are the only L functions that have poles at s equals 1, and t is equal to 0. So this proves that L of, um, L of chi of sigma plus i t doesn't vanish for sigma equals 1, provided chi squared is not equal to 1. So again, we've got this glitch turning up that characters chi squared uh, that L series are particularly difficult con con to control at the point one. Anyway, the, the, the conclusion we get from this is, is that um, um, the, 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 these L series um, never vanish um, on the line with real part sigma, with, with real part equal to one.
Um, there's an application of this I'll just mention. We can get a prime number theorem for arithmetic progressions. What this says is that the number of primes less than or equal to x, which are congruent to b modulo n for b n co prime, of course, um, is approximately x over log of x times 1 over phi of n. In other, more precisely, the number of primes is actually asymptotic to this, to this expression here. And you get the proof of this by sort of more or less copying the proof of the prime number theorem um, and combining it with the proof of Dirichlet's theorem. Um, and using the fact that, you then have to use the fact that L of chi of 1 plus i t is non-zero for all t in the same way we use the fact that zeta of 1 plus i t is non-zero to prove the prime number theorem for, um, for, 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 for all primes. Um, um, so you might think from this that the number of primes that a 3 mod 4 is going to be about the same as the number of primes for 1 mod 4, because they're both going to be, the, the number of them less than x is, for both of them, is going to be about x over log of x times a half. However, in fact, you find there are nearly always slightly more primes that are 3 mod 4, and there, there's a sort of rather interesting reason for this. What we're doing is we're really counting um, not primes, but primes plus a half of all primes, this is uh, half of all squares of primes plus a third of all um, cubes of primes, and so on. And it's really this number that is uh, that, that is roughly x over log of x. And most of the time we can neglect these terms here because they're much smaller. However, if we look at primes that are one mod four, we find p squared is one mod four. Whereas if we look at primes that are 3 mod 4, p squared is still 1 mod 4. So when we're counting things that are 1 mod 4, we're counting, um, we, we, we get extra terms from squares of primes. We get all the terms, all, pr primes that are either 1 or 3 mod 4 give an extra term for the squares of primes that, that's 1 mod 4. And this means that the number of primes that are 1 mod 4 is slightly less than the number of primes that are 3 mod 4, because some of the things that ought to be primes that are 1 mod 4 turn out to be really squares of primes that are 3 mod 4. So um, primes that are 1 mod 4 are slightly rarer than primes that are 3 mod 4 most of the time. Um, it's known that occasionally the number of primes that are 1 mod 4 will slightly exceed the number of primes that are 3 mod 4 that are less than x, but the, this only happens very rarely. Um, moreover, anything else you can do for the Riemann zeta function has an analogue for L series. So, so we have the Riemann hypothesis, which says that zeta of s is non-zero, provided the real part of s is greater than a half, which is the most notorious open problem in number theory. And similarly, we have an analogue of the Riemann zeta function, which says that the, um, the, the, the Dirichlet L series are also non-zero for real part of s greater than a half. And um, probably, any, if anybody found a proof of the, the Riemann hypothesis, everybody expects it would generalise rather easily to these other L series, because everything true for the Riemann zeta function has an analogue for these Dirichlet L series.